Thank you for letting us come. We're from New Hope Baptist Church, those of you who don't know. And uh, Brother Jeff said start right out, and so we're just excited uh, to be here tonight. I just want to mind the Lord this evening and uh, pray that He'll be praised, honored, and glorified. He's the only one worthy of all of that. And so you mind the Lord tonight, and uh, as we sing tonight, you just be obedient to Him, and uh, he'll, be, he'll be praised, and He'll be honored. So thank you for letting us be here tonight. Somebody's hurt, somebody's aching, somebody's trying to find a way. A heavy heart will break your will, a troubled soul leaves time standing still. So if you're searching, please don't hide. Lift up your head, I'm on your side. When every mountain seems to hide, when every river looks too wide, when my ship is lost at sea, that's when Jesus rescues me. My faith is strong and 
looking for an answer. Yes. Searching for some hope to hold. Yes. But empty hands will leave you waiting and praying for a miracle. Oh, but Jesus hears your every cry. He sees that mountain you can't climb. He will heal your hurt.
God is good. He's real good. Man, how how blessed. I never heard that song before, and I really like it. Um, I just want to thank you guys for the music. Thank you for coming out here, for all the visitors that came. Uh, we just want to say we're blessed to have you here. We thank you for being here. Everybody who's visiting, any visiting preachers, pastors, uh, evangelists, you know, the AGs. All right. All right. I'm Jeff Neff. My wife, Teresa, we're the youth leaders. There's Pastor Mike. He's our, he's our pastor. And Miss Jane. And, um, you know, it's not, about, it's not about any of us. It's about God. It's about Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Okay, so no matter what happens tonight, I just got to say to God be the glory. Great things he's, he's done. He's worthy of all praise. Okay, so one thing we like to do around here um, before we start anything, as early as possible, what we, what, one thing we like to do is just come up to the altar and pray. And so if you're able or if you're willing, uh, if you've got legs, uh, come on up to the altar, please. And we're just going to pray. We're going to ask God to, you know, just, just bless the service. We're going to ask God to plant some seeds, change some hearts, save some souls. Pastor Mike. Amen. All that can and will, let's gather in all tonight. Let's ask God to get right in the middle of the service tonight. Touch some heart, save a lost soul. Draw some backslidden sinner back to God tonight before it's eternally too late. Father, we love you. God, what an honor, what a privilege it is to be in the house, Lord, on a Friday night. God, what a privilege, Lord, to have these people with us tonight. God, thank you for this choir. Lord, it sang for us tonight. Lord, we appreciate New Hope Baptist Church. And Father, we appreciate their pastor, Brother Worley, and their youth pastor, Brother Sam. Father, thank you, Lord, for them and their friendship. And God, having them drive all the way to be with us tonight to sing, Lord, those blessed songs already. And God, I know that in this place on a Friday night with this many people, God, there's got to be some here tonight that's hurting in need of help tonight. And God, I believe that we have come to the right place, the right time, Lord, for the right hour that we may find that help. And Father, tonight, I pray God would open our hearts and minds and receive Lord, everything that you have in stores for us tonight, God, we'd go out of these doors, Lord, being blessed and relieved tonight of the pressures that are around us, saying it's been good to be in the house of God. Lord, just because we got to come and fellowship and worship a holy God tonight. Lord, if there's one that come in the doors tonight that's lost and undone, that does not know you as Lord and Master and Savior of their life, God, I pray something to be said or sung tonight. Father, that they did not leave this building tonight the way that they came in. God, that they would know you tonight, Lord, in the free part of sin and accept you as Savior of their life. God, if there's those that are wayward tonight, and God, they've been away from you in some way or shape, form, or fashion, I pray that tonight may be the night, God, that you'd search their hearts. And Father, you'd allow the good Holy Spirit of God to walk up and down every pew, every aisle tonight, God, and he'd convict that sinner Lord, it needs to be drawn to an altar. I don't care if it's now, in the middle of the singing, God, in the middle of the preaching, whatever it may be, God, get them at the foot of the cross. They may look up and see a holy God and realize they are full of grace and mercy, God, and you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ever ask or thank God that we say ever serve a God up in heaven. Father, that's looking down, waiting to take care of us, Lord, at this moment, Father, thank you for what you're going to do. God, for the next few moments here tonight, bless Brother Bill as he preaches to us tonight. Bless the AG family, God, as they come and minister to us in song tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this dear choir, Father, that's already sung for us. And, Father, we just want to worship you. We want to praise you. And, God, we want to thank you for what all, all the things you've done. Thank you, Brother Jeff, Miss Teresa, all the hard work they have poured into this thing. And, Father, bless them. God, for their endeavors to do all they've done. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you've done for us. And God, what you're going to do, we just praise you for it again. We ask all these things in Christ's wonderful name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. One thing that you'll you'll recognize around here is the altar is always open. There's no time that's off limits to come up to the altar, whether it's preaching, singing, anything. 
All right, so Brother A.G., if you want to, if you guys want to start getting ready. I have to admit, we're a little nostalgic. Some of us went to camp this past summer. Um, these guys were there, and we got to see uh, uh, Pastor Worley, Sam, all these guys. And, you know, it's nice. It's nice having everybody back together again. Um, and just God's good, and that's all I really have to say about it. And, you know, I, I can't think of a better place to be on a Friday night them right here. This is this is packed. I've seen a church on Friday night, so uh, it's it's amazing. All right, um, I love this family, and I love their their music. And I don't think you guys, I don't think I've ever said this to you, but your CDs on loop in our van, and they're you know, so <laughs> yeah, they're they're like turn that up, repeat. Turn up. So, um, anyways, so just do whatever the word as you do. to us and his word with all of our praise. He just came by. I told him to lift up the name of Jesus. Let's worship him now. Thank you. 
praise God. Brother Bill, you ready to preach? All right, thank you very much, A.G. family. Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn with me to the book of Jonah tonight. Jonah chapter 1 is where we're going to be. And while we're turning, I want to say how much it is a blessing and a privilege to be in the Lord's house on a Friday night. This is not the world's idea of a good time. Uh, but I'll tell you what, anything that God offers you is a far greater improvement than what the world has to offer. And uh, one thing that excites me is to seeing a, a room full of young people on a Friday night uh, and to hear the songs of Zion and to be able to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, it's a great place for you to be. I want to thank the AG family for their music tonight. There's two things. Uh, I've just only known them for just really a few months. Uh, camp this summer. I'll say a little bit more about camp in just a moment. But uh, with the AG family, there's two things I appreciate very much among many things. But one is uh, they live by faith in what they do. They're not entertainers. Uh, they live by faith and they trust the Lord and they seek to worship him in spirit and truth. And number two is if you ever talk to Brother AG one-on-one, -on -one, you'll find that he's not just a good musician. He knows the word. And that helps me. Uh, when I talk to somebody and uh, they use the Word of God as they talk, as they share principles, uh, we preachers need preaching too, and sometimes I get it in conversations just like that. And whether it was tonight or whether it was back this June when we were together, uh, those things stand out in my mind. But it's so good to see you young people. We were at camp, it seemed like, just a few weeks ago. And uh, I want to say to you parents that are here, if you sent your kids off to camp, and you say, boy, I'll tell you, we had a great time because they were not at the house and we could just not have to spend as much in groceries and everything else. Well, listen, I want you to know it was our privilege to have them at camp. And uh, I'm a firm believer in camp. And uh, so I do, I sort of view it, as our brother said, just sort of like a big reunion. You know, we had a great week. And uh, the nice thing is, is we're not as hot and sweaty as we were at camp. <laughs> Brother, I'm going to tell you, uh, it's you get just awful sweaty and hot and uh, sometimes just downright miserable at camp. And I thank God for air conditioning. And I'm going to tell you, some of you campers, I hardly recognized you because you look so nice and spiffy. Uh, some of you look so haggard and rough during camp. And some of you ladies were just like, oh, my hair and my makeup. Well, I'll tell you, amazing. Uh, transformation is taking place tonight. So if I don't recognize you, that's the reason why, all right? So the book of Jonah tonight is where we're going to be. For several weeks, uh, I've been asking the Lord, I said, Lord, what would you have us, what book would you have us to be in? Lord, what would your message be tonight? And I cannot get away from Jonah chapter 1. And so in just a moment, I'm going to read one verse. But before I do, I just want to briefly remind you of the story of Jonah. Jonah is a prophet of God. And God tells Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach to them. And Jonah says, I'm not going to do it. And so Jonah gets into a boat and he heads to a place that's called Tarshish, but he never makes it. Because God intervenes in a great way. But it's sad to say when you read Jonah chapter 1, here is the thing that you find, ladies and gentlemen. You find Jonah running from God. And young people, I want you to hear me well tonight. The most dangerous thing you can do this evening is to run from God. There may be some of you in this room, you were at camp, and you'd say, boy, God did a great work in my life, and you find yourself in Jonah's situation this evening. Yeah. I may be talking to some adults here tonight. Listen, there was a time in your life where you were much closer to God than you are tonight, and you know it. And the reason why is because you found yourself running from God. And so I want us to take a look at the life of Jonah tonight. We'll read just one verse to begin, but then we'll learn from his story in the whole chapter of chapter 1. 
Jonah chapter 1 tonight, verse number 17 is what I'd like to read. The Bible says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I have a good friend of mine who is from a different part of the United States. He's from the northern U.S. And he loves to pick on me about my heritage. Uh, I am unashamed of my southern redneck heritage. And we do. We go back and forth with each other. And he can do it to me because he is my friend and we're good natured. And I give it back to him in twice as much fashion as he gives it to me. But you know, I remember several years ago hearing a gentleman, he was talking about rednecks and he was poking fun at us. Part of it was because he was one. And the things that he said really rung true to me because of the way I was raised. I realized this guy was making money as a comedian, but the truth is what he said was what rednecks really do. I remember hearing him say something like this. He said, it, he said you, you might be a redneck if you ever cut your grass and find a car. Yeah. Amen. And it did make me remember growing up. There were certain places that was true. Yeah. And while people laugh and say, well, that's, that's impossible. I say, no, it's not. You just might be. I've seen yeah. it firsthand. Amen. I remember another time hearing this. He said, uh, you might be a redneck if you own a home that is mobile and you have five cars that are not. (laughs) Now, if you're here tonight and you say, I can relate, I can relate to that. I still remember we lived in a trailer and my dad had a broken down Datsun in the backyard. I used to get in it and play and thing wouldn't wouldn't run to save your life you know we had we had vehicles like that and so I hear this man and I'm like he is spot on (laughs) another time he said something like this he said you might be a redneck if you've ever hit a deer with your car deliberately (laughs) (laughs) and you know it really is I think about the neighborhood that I lived in most people hit them by accident you know And and you hear I hear that and I'm like he is spot on. You know, you, you're right. You might be. Another one, and I'll just share this and I'm going to go on. He said, you know, you might be a redneck if your porch collapses and you kill five dogs. <laughs> I thought when I went to Mamaw's house, that's exactly what could have happened, you know. I listened to that and uh, I say to myself, boy, I, I don't, I, this guy really has an insight into something. But this evening, lest you think I've just tried to be funny for the last five minutes, I've really told you this for a reason. The title of my message tonight is not, you might be a redneck if, if I, but I could share with you plenty of things. But the title of my message is this, you might be a Jonah if. Yeah. Yeah. And I want you to listen to me very carefully for the next few moments. You understand, Jonah didn't start out drowning in the ocean and being swallowed by a great fish. He started out as one of God's prophets. He was a messenger of God. We condemn Jonah for running from God. We say, Jonah, that's the worst thing you can do. And you're right, but I'm afraid that there may be some of us in this room this evening that are guilty of the same exact thing. And while I may not know how, and while I may not know when, listen to me, God got Jonah's attention. And he can get yours. So I want you to listen to me just for the next few minutes as we look at Jonah chapter 1. Young person, I want you to see the worst thing you can do is run from God tonight. And so I want you to hear me out. Number one, you might be a Jonah if God says one thing and you do the opposite. Notice with me verse number one. The Bible tells us, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry before it, 
for their wickedness is come up before me. And then verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You might be a Jonah if God says one thing and you do another. Now let me explain to you what happens here. The Bible says that the Lord was the one who spake unto Jonah. You understand this is not just an ordinary human being. This is God Almighty that speaks to him. How many of you have siblings? Raise your hand. Any of you have siblings? All right. I'm not going to ask you how many of you wish you didn't have siblings because that hurt people's feelings. But some of you don't get along, but you ought to be thankful for them. But, you know, it's one thing when your brother or sister says something. You know, when your brother or sister comes up to you and says, Hey, you need to get in the house. You just sort of look at them and blow them off like you just go do something else. We're not listening to you. But when your sibling comes out in the yard and says, Hey, Daddy said, you know what? All of a sudden you perk up and you say, I think I better go in. You know why? It's because of who's saying it. All right, young people, I hope that just like you would hopefully respect your parents, that you'd respect your pastor, that you'd respect your authority. Listen to me. When God says something, you better pay attention. And God tells Jonah, it's not complicated. Young people, I want to tell you tonight, it's not that God tells me complicated things and I don't understand it. No, God tells me simple things, and when I don't obey them, it's just pure disobedience, not the ignorance. It's not a lack of comprehension. But young person, if you're here in this room tonight and you know what God's word says and you find yourself living in disobedience, listen to me, you might be a Jonah. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh and the Bible tells us that he gets into a boat. He's going to rise to flee unto where? Tarshish. I'm not going to give you a geography lesson tonight, but that was in the exact opposite direction as Nineveh. You ever watch youngins in a grocery store? There's some of you single kids here tonight. You're not married yet, don't have any children, and you think you're an authority on parenting. You walk into the grocery store and you see some kid throw a good old-fashioned southern hissy fit. You know what I'm talking about? And I've walked down there and I'm like, boy, if I'd have done that, my dad would have killed me. There's no way that I could do that. But I want you to imagine with me if you were in a situation somewhere and a parent told their child, said, now listen, I want you to get up and I want you to go over there. And that kid looked his parents square in the eyes and walked right over to the other side of the room. What would you be thinking? Oh, I know what you'd be thinking. You'd say, he just made a big mistake. Because you know what, young people? It's not just that he said, no, I'm not going there. But with a little bit of attitude, he said, I'm going this way. That's exactly what Jonah did. Young people, there are some of you tonight. God has you here this evening. Why? Because He wants to save you from sorrow. He wants to save you from ruining your life. He wants to save you from scarring you and you yourself. And you find yourself in this service tonight, and you know God has said one thing, and you take the last two months of your life, and this you've gone the other direction. You might think it's fun now. You say, well, it sure feels good. Don't you be deceived by feelings because there's only pleasure in sin for a season. But my friend, if you're here tonight and you're running, I'm telling you, you might be a Jonah if God says one thing and you do the opposite. I don't know tonight why Jonah didn't go. I've not interviewed him about it. When I get to heaven, maybe I can, but there's several things that I can speculate on. Maybe Jonah just didn't want to. Some of the biggest messes we'll get to in our lives is when we don't want to do what God tells us to do. Better for you to be honest tonight than to wear a halo before this preacher. I'd much rather you just say, you know what, preacher, you're exactly right. That's the way that I feel. You say, I just don't want to. I know that I shouldn't be dating this person. I know that I shouldn't be listening to this music. I know that I shouldn't be doing this. But in your heart, you say it, but I just, I don't want to obey God. Jonah, what are you doing? I don't know. It could have been that Jonah was afraid. These people that God called him to go preach to, they were some of the vilest, meanest people in civilization. Man alive, they had killed people mercilessly. 
Jonah said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not going there. Maybe it was because of fear. And you know what? There's some people that run to God today for the same reason, fear. I'm telling you, it may be that there's a young person in this room tonight. God wants you to be on a mission field as a missionary one day. And the reason you're running right now is because of fear. I may be talking to a young lady. Maybe one day God wants you to marry a preacher. A young man, God one day wants you to preach the gospel and be a pastor. And right now, you're running in the opposite direction. Why? Because of fear. But I'll tell you what truly changes us is when we fear being out of the will of God more than we fear being in the will of God. I want to ask you, why are you running? Why are you disobeying? Before I go to the second point, I want to tell you this, young people. Listen to me. Every time God gives you a command, there will always be a ship going to Tarshish. Hey, young people, I'm glad you're here on a Friday night. You know what? Back in your churches, you be there every time the doors are open. Don't you forsake the assembling of yourselves. God made that very plain. Don't disobey that. The things that God has set before you very plainly, you know there's things you ought not be doing, things you ought not be listening to, associations you ought not have. Listen to me. It's not a, you say, well, I just don't want to obey God. Listen to me. There'll come a day you wish you had. But you might be a Jonah if God says one thing and you do another. But I want to tell you this tonight. You might be a Jonah if you're willing to pay a price for your sin to so you can sin. The Bible tells us in verse 3 when he's going to run from God that he found a ship going to Tarshish and he paid the fare... They're up. You see, Jonah was willing to pay a price to run in the opposite direction. And listen to me, I find that people today are still willing to pay a price. But here's the sad reality. It costs them more than they ever could have imagined. I may be talking to a married couple in here tonight. And it may be that you've been married for years. And you found some wandering in your heart. And you say, boy, I'm getting ready to pay that price. Listen to me. I promise you, when it's paid, it's going to cost you more than you could ever imagine. A moment of pleasure can bring you a lifetime of sorrow. You're here tonight and you're standing at the desk and you say, hey, I'm willing to pay this price. Listen to me. Once you pay that price, it is non-refundable. You don't get it back. You find yourself at a season of life where you say, boy, I just want to go live the way that I want. You say, I don't care. I'm just going to to live the way that I want. You throw your purity to the wind. Listen to me, young person. You pay that price, and you've paid a price you could have never imagined before what you're going to be paid. It's amazing what we do when we're blinded by sin and selfishness, what we're willing to pay. When I was over in Israel on a trip about 2010, I watched an older gentleman. He was sitting in a shop in Jerusalem. And boy, I'm telling you, these people and these these peddlers, man, they were fleecing people left and right. I watched a man pay $80 for a suitcase that I knew wasn't more worth more than 20. And I, I thought to myself, man, I hate it for that guy. He he really, he really, he really got bamboozled. And you know what I find every year when I preach to hundreds of teens in the summertime? You know what I find? I find that there are some, you know what, they paid a price and it left them desolate. And I look and I say, boy, I hate they paid that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Now, if you're here tonight and you say, preacher, I have paid that price and I have scarred myself. I'm not here to tell you to lay further upon your shame. I'm here to tell you, you know what? All right, you admit where you're at. You get up on your feet and you go forward with God and you do the best you can. But there are some of you in this room this evening, listen to me, you're on the verge of paying a price that's going to scar you. You better listen to me. You better think about what you're about to pay. Might cost you your reputation. It may cost you your testimony. It'll cost you things far greater than money could ever buy. If 
you're here tonight and you're willing to pay a price for your sin, you might be a Jonah. But before I go any further, young people, I want to remind you of something. Jonah was willing a, to pay a price to sin. Jesus Christ paid a price for sin. You know, to me, one of the biggest deterrents and one of the biggest things that tells me to get off that ship and go after following God is when I look at the cross and I realize what Jesus paid yeah. for my sin. Make no mistake, Jesus didn't pay to sin, but he paid for my sin with his precious blood. And my friend, if you're here tonight and you're a child of God and you find yourself on a Friday night and your heart is dear or away from God, listen to me, there's no faster way to warm up your heart than to see Calvary. Amen. How can we look at Calvary and Jesus being nailed on the cross for our sins and walk away ungrateful? We want our way, and yet Jesus Christ gave himself willingly to die for us. Amen. Oh, Jonah was willing to pay a price, and it cost him dearly, but God the Father gave his son. It cost him a great price yes, that we yes, might yes. be redeemed. Yes, and my friend, if you're here tonight, and you say, I've been to these youth meetings. I know that I need to be saved, and you just continue running from God. Listen to me. It's the worst mistake you'll make. If you're here tonight and you need to be saved, you don't need to run to God. You need to run, you run away from God. You need to run to Him. Amen. You might be a Jonah if you're willing to pay a great price to sin. You know what? You might be a Jonah if you're unconcerned about your relationship with God. You know, a lot of you young people, I'd hope during camp that you made decisions to draw closer to the Lord. It was a week that you really sensed that God was working in your life. And maybe soon after camp, you get into the flow of life. And now you find yourself on a November night, several months removed from camp. And your heart is just as cold and unconcerned about a relationship with God yeah. as it was before you came to camp. Right. If that's the case, you might be a Jonah. Notice with me verse number 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man to his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. I think my second son, Jared, can sleep through just about anything. We could light a cannon. We could put a whole tub of tannerite outside and shoot it. And he'd not wake up. The boy just, he loves sleep. He, can, he just has a way. He can just sleep. You ever thought about what Jonah slept through here? Some of y'all say, I'm a light sleeper. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you'd have been a light sleeper, you wouldn't have slept at all what Jonah slept through. You say, it was a big storm. Yeah, it was a storm, but these rough and tumbling mariners are up there screaming, throwing everything off the boat. Listen to me. They're making a lot of racket, and yet Jonah is asleep. Let me tell you something. Jonah's physical sleep was a sign that he was spiritually asleep. I want to ask you, are you concerned about your relationship with God? You say, well, that's why I'm here tonight. Well, you know what? And that's a good thing. You're to be commended, but I'm going to tell you what really reveals whether or not you're concerned about your relationship with God. Did you spend time with Him today? Amen. Did you spend time with Him this week? Did you spend time with Him last week? You say, well, you know, in order to be a Jonah, you've got to be swallowed by a whale. No, listen to me. In order to be a Jonah, all you've got to do is be sitting in a church pew, sleeping while you ought to be listening. Right. Amen. Right. You know, if you're here tonight and you say, man, whenever I hear preaching, it's just like I just want to just wish the time away. If that's the way you feel, I say with all due respect, you might be a Jonah. 
If you're here and you say, Preacher, I'm just, I, I, I know I'm saved, but I don't have much of a relationship with God. You need to quit seeing yourself as just simply a good kid who's trying to do the best he can. And tonight you need to see yourself as a Jonah. Yeah. And get off the ship. Amen. He's asleep spiritually. Jonah goes down into Joppa. Go, Jonah goes down into the boat. I think there's significance to that. When I went to Israel and I went to Tel Aviv, which is right there with the Old Testament Joppa, where this was at, in order to get down to the water, you had to go down. You kept going down and down. And then Jonah gets down into the boat and he goes down into the ship in order to sleep. There's only one direction when you're running from God, and it's down. Yeah. Now, some of you tonight, you might say, well, preacher, you know, running downhill, I like that. You remember when you was a kid, running uphill was no fun. Running downhill was fun. Let me tell you something. Running downhill is fun until you lose control. I still remember one time I was riding a bike downhill, and uh, I didn't think about this, but the grass was wet, and I tried to use my brakes, and boy, I was going downhill, and all I did was just skid in a straight line right into a briar patch. It tore me up. You say, I like going downhill. You like going down. You'll like it until it's out of control and it runs you into a mess that you can't stop. Here this fellow was. He was sleeping spiritually. Listen, there are some of you tonight. Maybe at one time in your life you made great strides and now you find yourself numb to God. Listen to me. You might be a Jonah. If you're unconcerned about your relationship with God. I want to tell you also tonight, you might be a Jonah when your walk is not consistent with your talk. Now let me tell you some of the best people to sniff out hypocrisy. That's teenagers. I want every parent to listen to me. Listen, there's been many a sermon negated. Because children see parents in the home and see them in the church and see two different yeah. things. You want to disillusion your children and you want to teach them that God's not that important, then don't live what you hear preached. Yeah. That's right. Amen. But now teenagers, now I've preached my sermon to adults, but now I want to preach it to you for just a second. Can you listen for a moment? Sometimes teenagers are very good at smelling the hypocrisy of everybody else. And not themselves. Amen. Now before I quit preaching and go to meddling. Some of you say you've already done that. I know your parents aren't perfect. And neither are you. I'm not excusing their imperfections. But I'm saying every once in a while we've got to look in the mirror. And I want to show you Jonah's hypocrisy. And I want to show you sometimes where we can't see for our own shortcomings. We don't even see our own shortcomings just like Jonah. I want you to hear what Jonah tells him. Look here with me in verse number 8. They're throwing everything out of the boat. The Bible says, Then they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause is this evil upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? You understand, they're about to die, and they throw questions at Jonah left and right. I mean, they're nosy. They're wanting to know his business. Time is short. You better spill your guts, buddy, because this is connected to you, and you need to tell us what's going on. You ever been interrogated by your parents? Oh, they have the sixth sense. It's built in. They know you're up to foolishness. And you come in, they ask all the right questions. Who were you with? Where did you go? What'd you, you know, you're just like, oh, would they stop asking questions? Well, they interrogate Jonah. And now I want you to see Jonah's hypocrisy. Verse number 9. He said unto them, I am... And Hebrew. You know what he was telling them? These people, they were lost pagans. And Jonah tells them, I am one of God's people. I am a Hebrew. 
Was that right? It was right. But here's the thing. He wasn't living like one of God's children. It's a blessing to be able to see people rejoice when they sing or whenever they're worshiping. That's a blessing. But you always make sure, young person, it's not just a show. You make sure that the God that you say you serve is the God you live for in the public high school. Yeah. And for all of us in this room, we might be a Jonah if we live a hypocritical life where we say, well, I'm a child of God. I think everybody in here would say, boy, I'm a child of God. I hope you can say that. If you can't, you can before the night is over. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But my friend, if you're a child of God here tonight, don't just say that you're a child of God, but you live like one. Otherwise, you might be a Jonah. Jonah says, I am an Hebrew. But then notice, hey, teens, let's sniff this one out a little bit more. It says, and then he goes on to say, and I fear the Lord. You should be reading this story like, That's fear in God. I'd hate to see what rebellion is. <laughs> you know, Jonah had fooled himself. Here was a man who said, I fear God, yet he disobeyed him. Right. Young people, you want to be smart? I hope so. One guy shaking his head like this. He's confined to a life of dumbness the rest of his life. Brother. <laughs> I hope all of you won't be smart. And I'm going to tell you how to do it tonight. You say, oh, brother, he's going to tell us we ought to get in our math books and we ought to get in our English books and we ought to, we ought to hit the book. No, I'm not even going to talk about school today. Oh, you're like, okay, then say on. All right, listen to me. I'm going to tell you how to be smart. Listen to me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning yes. That's of right. wisdom. That's, right. That's it. You don't have to do dumb things all your life. Hey, let me tell you, instead of fearing your friends, fear God. Yeah. Instead of fearing what people may say, fear God. That's right. Jonah said, I fear God, and yet he lived in disobedience. Yeah. And then notice what else he says. He says, I fear the Lord God. Now listen to this. The God of heaven, which hath made the sea... And the dry land. We say, well, that's true. I mean, God made it. He did. How many of you go to public school? Raise your hands. All right. You put them down. You know what? I went to public school too. And I'm glad that you can be salt and light. And listen to me when the biology teacher comes in front of you and says, this all came took place millions of years ago without God. You can just simply say, it's not we that made ourselves. The Lord made us. And God's the one that created us. And you can stand unapologetically for that, regardless of what the crowd says. But yeah. here's, what, here's, what, here's what Jonah said. Jonah said basically, hey, I know that God made the land and the sea. But you know what Jonah did? Jonah used the sea as a means to escape from God. That's hypocritical, isn't it? God made the sea, but I'm going to get in this boat and I'm going to go in the opposite direction. Here's the thing, Jonah couldn't smell his own hypocrisy, and many times we can't either. Right. And listen to me, if you're here tonight, and your walk is not consistent with your talk, you just might be a Jonah. But here's the last thing I tell you tonight. You might be a Jonah if you'll do anything but repent. Talk about beating your head against a wall. That's exactly what you do when you keep telling God no. Right. Jonah would have rather died in that raging ocean. You know, you find later on in the story in Jonah 1, they throw him overboard. But even at that point, you don't find Jonah saying, God, I am sorry. I should have went. I will go. No, they just throw him overboard into the water. Jonah was purpose. He'd do anything but repent at that point. 
He knew that he had sinned. He knew that his sin was affecting other people around him. And he even knew that God was judging him. And he said no. I know repentance is not fun. Nobody says it's fun. I mean, how many of you have a hobby of just going around saying, I was wrong, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We hate that by human nature. Amen. But there's only one way to get off that boat tonight, and it's called repent. Listen, there's some of you young ladies in this room, you have a bright future. If you'd humble yourself before God and say, you know what, I need to get right. Amen. That's the only way you can get off that boat. In good standing with God. Yes. You look around, you know that what you're doing is wrong. You know that your sin is affecting other people. It is grieving your mom or your dad or your pastor or other people, close friends around you. They are grieved and you still say no. And you'll get hardened so much to the point Amen. that you even know that God is judging you. And you'll say no. You know, there's one thing that would have ended all this craziness. The last three chapters of the book of Jonah would never have been written if Jonah would have stood up in that boat and said, God, you're right. I'm wrong. Please forgive me. You know, when I talk to teenagers, and I talk about school sometimes, and sometimes a girl will roll her eyes and say, boy, school is just filled with drama. And that's the truth. No, oh, they say, oh, school is just drama. She says this, and he says that. It's just drama, 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 craziness. Some of you could write a book after your high school years, just entitled it Drama. Say, it's just nothing but a lot of craziness. And you're right. But listen, when you run from God, there's only one way to stop the craziness, and that's to repent. Right. You might be a Jonah if you're willing to do anything else but repent. That's right. Now, I want to end the message tonight by telling you something that it might startle you. And it's something, to be honest, I've never done outside this message. You know what, about every, mess, every message that I've preached except for this one, I could say basically was primarily original with me. Now, there's nothing new under the sun. We preachers know that. But, I mean, it's something that I labored for and put the bones together and put it all together. That's, that's the vast majority of my messages. But this particular message that I've preached to you tonight is not that way. This last July, I got a phone call in the middle of July that one of our students, at ambassador who was a rising junior, was killed in a hunting accident. This boy sat in my evangelist class and this outline that I've preached to you primarily tonight was an outline that he never preached. Here was a young man who knew what it was like to be a Jonah at times in his life. I'm talking about a boy who wrestled with things like some of you are wrestling with right now. And when I sat down and I read that message, I said, God, nobody may ever hear it from his lips. But I think it's worthwhile for some young people yeah. to hear. Young people, if you'll humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, God will lift you up. It may be that there's just one or two tonight. It could be that there's several. You say, preacher, I'm on a boat tonight and I'm running away from God. I don't care whether you're 18 or whether you're 80. Tonight's the time to get off. Amen. You might be a Jonah. If. Let's bow our heads together in prayer.
I wonder if there's some people in this room tonight, you'd say, Brother, you'd say, Alton, I've heard this message tonight, and I'm going to tell you one thing. I've been running from God. I know that I need to be saved, and I've just been running from God left and right. 